can you tell us tell me why you're running for the congress what is your main driving force behind it sure i uh well i have a passion to serve uh i always have i um moved down from long island to dc when i was 17 and i was working on the capitol hill um when i was 19 i was part of the washington leadership program uh working for congress and marty Meehan from massachusetts and i was um publishing at that time in News India Times about um, needing more Indian Americans in politics, um, needing more representation. And I have followed through with that uh, commitment and that conviction throughout my studies from my bachelor's to my master's to my PhD program in political science and international relations and uh, throughout my service with the Department of Defense for nearly the past two decades. I would like to hear from you about your Indian American roots and that of your parents. Sure. So I am uh, born and raised in Long Island, as I mentioned. My father is from Kashmir, um, from a place called Safapur, and my mother is Punjabi, and she's from Delhi. And you spent most of your life in Long Island before moving to... Uh, Correct, yeah. I, I spent most of my life growing up in Long Island, a few years in Wayne, New Jersey as well, um, where I attended Vidya Peet as a kid. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was studying Sanskrit, Vedic heritage, um, Hindi, uh, the mythology, the religion, um, and uh, yes, and then I shifted to um, to DC when I was 17 for college. And you have worked in the federal government as well in different roles in DOD. And Correct. Um, so majority of my career has been with the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. I worked for a number of large defense contractors and consulting firms, including Deloitte, General Dynamics IT, Lidos, Booz Allen Hamilton, um, and then I was also a director, a GS-15, at the Department of Defense. Um, and then you have a think tank experience as well. Correct. I also have worked for a number of think tanks, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, their South Asia Center, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, their Dialogue Department, uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, I was actually in their Middle East Center, located in Beirut, Lebanon, and um, I have also led studies for Rand Corporation. I was working there as well on uh, governance development in Afghanistan. Normally in this town, it's a revolving door with the government and the think tanks, right? Correct. You're opening a new door, trying to open a new door, the <laughs> Congress. Why you have decided to run for the Congress? So, as I've mentioned, I... Um, I had a conviction at an early age. Um, I think I think if I go back even further mm -hmm. to when I was five, um, that was 1989. And that was when um, my father was sharing accounts of the tension in Kashmir. Um, and I was very interested in learning more about Kashmir. And I made it a point to focus my studies uh, on understanding um, the conflict there, the situation. Um, <clears throat> and. I had a desire to eventually run for Congress, um, but obviously it's a, it's a path, it's a journey to get there. And so I first devoted my studies, my first three degrees to, um, to understanding diplomacy, negotiation, um, political science, all the theory that you need to understand. And then um, the think tank world was really critical because obviously, um, I mean, these think tanks put out um, the underpinnings of our foreign policy. Um, and then working for the Department of Defense uh, was where where I served. Um, and so I have definitely followed in the footsteps of Abigail Spamberger and nine, there are about nine National Security Democrats who have um, entered into Congress with prior service in the Department of Defense. So coming from the national security uh, defense space, um, several of whom I know personally as well. And um, in Virginia in particular, it's a very common story because here, uh, this, this is where the Department of Defense is housed. This is where the Pentagon is, all, you know, the agency, the Beltway agencies are headquartered here and, uh, and several Air Force bases. And so um, in this service, I feel that I um, am really equipped to now enter into, um, into the seat because my constituents are all, um, for the most part, uh, they all work with the Department of Defense. Um, 
the bread and butter of District 10 is defense contracting, military, um, defense civilians, small businesses uh, with defense contracts. And I say that because as it translates to the core issues, right? If you look at the economy, if you look at job creation, um, that is that is what people here care about um, predominantly. Um, and so I think that this is, um, everything that I've done has just led to my path now, which is my calling. What are the main issues of uh, well, this district on which you are running? What's the promise to them? Sure. My three core issues, um, the first uh, foremost being is education. Um, so I have a commitment to just uh, enhance education here um, and the schools. Um, that is something that uh, hits very close to heart to most of the District 10 um, voters. Mm -hmm. Um, the second one is um, better in our healthcare system here. As I mentioned, we have a lot of small business owners and just making healthcare more affordable mm -hmm. and more accessible. Um, so from uh, prescription drugs to seeing specialists, um, that is something that uh, is a concern. And the third is public safety, making sure we have safe neighborhoods, safe schools, mm -hmm. um, safe communities. Uh, if you're elected to the Congress, Congress has an important role to play in national security and global peace. What would be your top priorities when it comes to foreign policy and national security? Sure. So uh, most of my work has been in counterterrorism, mm -hmm. counterinsurgency, and countering violent extremism. I would say that uh, as it comes when it comes to national security, I would take a very strong stance on. Um, on countering terrorist activity, mm -hmm. um, which is what, again, I've focused on in my studies and in my work. I have um, actually led counterterrorism cells. I have worked very closely with the National Counterterrorism Center, for example, mm -hmm. uh, with um, the former deputy director of the War on Terror. Mm -hmm. And I um, I led a night shift cell on at US Central Command on um, when we were at war with Syria and Iraq. Uh, it was called the ISIS crisis cell, and that was under Secretary Austin, our current Secretary of Defense. Uh, you are from the Kashmiri origin, Kashmiri uh, diaspora, right? Yes. There are quite a number of Kashmiri people here in the U.S. Correct. Uh, there are already five Indian American congressmen in the House. Uh, what is the sense of response you are receiving both from the Kashmiri community and the Indian Americans nationwide? Uh, very positive. Okay. I have a great deal of support. Uh, from several organizations um, that uh, that you know back Indian American candidates uh, that back South Asian American candidates um, across the country. Uh, I have been getting um, contributions from Indian Americans from uh, a variety of cities, you know, from San Francisco to Atlanta, Chicago, Houston, New York, um, and obviously locally a lot of local support here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's been, it's been, there's been an outpouring of support and it's been very, you know, um, it's overwhelming in a positive way of how, um, how much there is a sense that, you know, of the community coming together. And that is um, the Indian American community at large, but also the Kashmir Bandit community, uh, um, the Punjabi community, the Sikh community, because I am, um, I am part Hindu and part Sikh. Um, and the Telugu community, for example, in um, mm -hmm. within District 10, Gujarati community <laughs> in Bengali. So there's, there's so many, um, obviously, different uh, groups within the Indian American community. Um, and I think that it's been, it's been great, especially with Diwali season. Mm -hmm. There's been lots of, uh, lots of events, lots of speaking engagements and opportunities to really just connect with um, with the communities that we have uh, across the area. You know, so we have five Indian American lawmakers in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, another five, at least another five are running for Congress this time, including you. And then we have two presidential candidates in the mm -hmm. Republic of India, one vice president. Uh, can you give us a sense what is why the community looks like very politically active in the last 10 years and they have emerged here? What is your sense? Yeah. There's always two ways to look at it, right? So when I was 19, right. um, we didn't have any members. Right? Right. I mean, we had, at the time when I published this article, right? Mm -hmm. um, this was in uh, like 2004, uh, we had Bobby Jindal, right? Um, but we didn't have all these role models to really emulate and see a path. 
And um, I'm definitely proud of the fact that we now have five standing members of Congress, um, several of whom I'm, I'm friends with, um, and I think that they're um, you know, doing great work and representing the community. Um, and I think it's great that we have a few that are also now running. Again, mm -hmm. a few of them who I, uh, who I know personally and right. have known for many years. Right. Um, but I would say that, at, you know, looking at it holistically, um, I still believe that, you know, the Indian American community is underrepresented. Um, we may have five members, but we should have maybe closer to 25 members of Congress. Um, so as uh, looking at our community, we, um, we definitely could do more. I think we need more political participation. We need more of a voice. Um, we definitely need more Indian American women members of Congress. Uh, we only have one yeah. currently. Yeah. Um, four of them obviously are men. And so uh, I think that uh, we should uh, should look at that to say, where, you know, where can we be in the next five years? And how can we um, be more politically active and have more of a voice in Congress? As someone from Kashmir, you have been to travel to the valley, met people as part of the PhD thesis, met a lot of people over there. How do you see Kashmir now from here? Kashmir for the last 70 years, it has been one of the turbulent places in India because mm -hmm. of terrorism, separatist activities. In the last few years, there have some changes there. Uh, as someone who is from the valley, whose parents have roots from the valley, how do, and someone who has visited there, met a lot of people, interacted, the thesis has been there. How do you see that place from now? Yeah, I think that, so Kashmir has gone through a lot of transition. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, when, the first time I went there, when I lived there, was in 2011. Um, I've been back a few, I've you know, been back a few times since then. So I was back in 2014, mm -hmm. in 2017, and actually most recently I was there just two months back. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, I make it a point to keep in touch with Kashmir and uh, to go and visit at least every few years so that I um, am touching and feeling and, and connected uh, with it, um, there's just nothing like that. You don't get that from articles or from um, watching news. Uh, but yeah, there's been a huge shift, obviously, after the uh, removal of Article 370, um, and also with with the G20, right? So Kashmir, the infrastructure there has really revamped. It's um, from just seeing like the roads to the whole city has been repainted. Um, so it's definitely. Um, it's definitely looks very different than how it was. It's I think uh, there's been quite a lot of development. Uh, there's been more job creation, um, less of a brain drain, uh, more technology coming into the valley there. And so I think there's like there's a roadmap now of seeing the growth um, that Prime Minister Modi has has created there. Um, I think that yeah. So it it has gone from a place where there has, you know, there's obviously yeah. been turbulence. Um, there's been violence and, and riots. And, you know, when I was there at the time too, I, right. I saw some of that as well. And now I think it's pretty stabilized. I mean, now tourism is uh, yeah. dramatically increased and there's less of fear of going back to Kashmir. Um, and I think it's great because Kashmir is a beautiful paradise on earth. It's mm -hmm. uh, there's, um, there is just nothing like it. It's it's uh, unmatched um, from any other place I've ever seen, and I uh, am a big advocate of people going to visit Kashmir. Uh, and I would love to take delegations to actually go and um, to experience the culture, um, the traditions, um, and uh, and the community there. Is there anything that's something we can learn from now? the way peace is coming to Kashmir for the other hot spot of the world? Anything we can learn from? Yeah, um, so I I have studied patterns of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in a way, uh, conflicts are very unique in nature. Um, they, obviously the history plays a big role in it. Um, the, it could be um, religion, it can be resources to um, uh, different types of uh, movements and groups that mm -hmm. that become active um, and how let's say a movement evolves or a conflict evolves. Um, but I think in the case of Kashmir it's, it, um, 
it was frozen for quite a while. Right. And uh, I think what Prime Minister Modi did was, I mean, he overturned an article and uh, it went through a very dramatic shift rapidly. That's not something very common or something that I think could maybe be duplicated in other places only because of the unique character, unique character and structure of, it, you know, it was a mm. semi-autonomous uh, self-governing state, right? right? It, had, it, you know, it had a prime minister, then it had a chief minister, it had its own flag. I mean, there were certain mm. dynamics in Kashmir that were very unique. I don't think that's something that is um, common in other conflicts, but I guess looking at more of a grassroots level, right, there, there was this mm. resistance movement um, that existed. Um, and that has really quieted and died down uh, now for several years. So I would say uh, in regards to other conflicts, I mean, strong leadership is something that um, is maybe what you could look at to, to be replicated. Um, having a, a strong leader come and make a, a decisive decision right. is something that you could look at. But it, again, it would have to be in the context and fit with the nature of okay. of that particular mm-hmm. um, that particular region. One second, last question about uh, what are your thoughts on India U.S. relationship? Sure. So I <clears throat> was recently uh, in Delhi. Mm-hmm. And I was part of the Business 20, the B20 Summit, um, and I got to attend um, some some parts of the G20 Summit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a really exciting time to be in Delhi, mm-hmm. um, naturally. And the B20 Summit in particular, mm-hmm. uh, that was something that um, hit very close to home in terms of what I do. Uh, the whole theme was US India bridging the skills gap. Um, so I had the unique opportunity of meeting with um, several of the CEOs Uh, for Lockheed Martin India, Salesforce India, Boeing India, um, in very intimate settings. And uh, we discussed um, about bringing a lot of the the great IT skills that India has to offer into um, into, the US economy um, and making, forging all those partnerships. Uh, So I think that there's great talent, especially you have a lot of IIT run companies uh, from Mm -hmm. India Mm -hmm. that are now breaking into Silicon Valley, Mm -hmm into um, greater Washington, D.C., doing work with um, a lot of the large defense contractors in particular, um, and uh, with um, uh, commercial companies as well, in terms of bringing AIML algorithms and technology platforms here. Um, so I see, a, I see a lot of activity happening there, and of course more can be done for sure, but that's something I've been a big advocate of, and being able to be part of those discussions and helping to move the U.S.-India relationship forward is something I'm uh, that I'm an advocate of. And uh, looking at the U.S.-India defense relationship, you know, so we've seen obviously the U.S.-India nuclear deal. Yeah. Um, and I went to Johns Hopkins. I studied under uh, Professor Ashley Tellis right. um, when I was there. I was writing papers about you know the shift that happened mm-hmm. post U.S.-India nuclear deal, and then I got to actually live through some of that. So working in the Department of Defense, just seeing. Um, what the relationship was with India, where it is now, and um, and how it is evolving. I think that definitely a lot more can be done in that space. Um, we can improve relations, but it it is a uh, it is steadily uh, moving in the right direction, and um, I'm happy to see that. And I do think that we um, we can do a lot more because again, you're looking at the oldest uh, democracy in the world and the largest democracy in the world. Right. And India is, um, it is a natural ally for the United States. It always has been. And I think it's great that President Biden is, um, is showing that mm-hmm. in a lot of his, um, uh, in his actions. The campaign is very early stages right now, right? Yes. And you have a long way to go. But how does your typical day as a campaign looks like now? Uh, <laughs> That's a great How question. How are you preparing for the campaign? That's a great question. You know, campaigns are always, um, uh, you know, they can be a bit unpredictable, right, in terms of your day-to-day, uh, what you do. But I'd say that uh, in, in terms of my campaign, um, it's been great that I've built up uh, some some momentum on it, uh, great momentum on it. And I've had 
you know, lots of um, press interviews. I've had speaking engagements, um, sometimes up to five per day. Uh, I've got um, a really amazing team mm -hmm. of uh, 50 plus and growing, um, some of the top firms in this country. And uh, most importantly, just connecting with the community. The opportunity to speak with, for example, the Korean um, American community here, the Thai American community, the Indian American community, um, the veteran community, uh, the defense contractors here, uh, uh, moms, uh, you know, who who demand. There's a lot of different groups mm -hmm. that I've been able to um, have focus groups with and to speak. You know, what are what are the issues to have that organic discussion, the Q and A, and so. Um, so every day might look a bit different, <laughs> um, but it has been really enthralling. Um, just the amount of um, openness that I've received um, on the campaign and the amount of volunteers too. I think that's a huge aspect of it. When you start seeing, um, it's very inspiring to see all these young, I have uh, a lot of young people who joined the campaign. Um, I have disabled veterans. I have, um, some folks who you know come from the defense contracting world, young Indian American girls who really want to enter politics. They're in you know their early twenties, um, high school students uh, that want to study political science, and uh, and it's it's inspiring uh, to see that Indian American girls and boys, um, and just I have a very diverse group, you know Brazilian. So it's it's really nice to see the um, that international element and just. To have that uh, that backing and support from people who are you know who are volunteering their time um, because they believe in they believe in you. Thank you so much.